the spotlight on him. There, there you go. Well, thank you, uh, Amy, and thank you, Mary, for the invitation to uh, the Cook uh, Memorial Hi. Library. And uh, thanks also to New Hampshire Humanities for um, arranging this uh, visit. Uh, the visit is virtual, but uh, Amy did give me a, a tour of the uh, water art exhibit in the library. So I feel like I'm in your presence. So thank you very much for that. Thank you um, for the invitation to, for introducing me to Tamworth, uh, its waters and lands and uh, two citizens groups that have made a pretty big difference there, the uh, Green Mountain Conservation Group and the Chokura Lake Conservancy, if I pronounce that sort of okay, it's uh, thanks to Mary, thanks to Amy for that. In these organizations, I found some stirring examples of citizen action around water, uh, land conservation around water, uh, water protection, water testing, um, public education, and also improving aquatic habitat. So uh, that's down my alley. During the next 40 minutes or so, um, you'll see that that kind of work by those organizations is a priority in many parts of New Hampshire. You also see the many ways that inland waters have helped shape the state. I'm reporting to you tonight from the second floor of the Historical Society of Cheshire County in Keene, where the internet connectivity is substantially more reliable and stable than it is where I live in the tiny town of Roxbury, just outside of Keene. So now let me put that internet connection to work uh, as I share a, a, a screen for a presentation. Just a sec. Bear with me here, please. Here we go. Nine years ago, the um, state of New Hampshire set up a commission to study uh, fresh water in the state. There were concerns at that time about contamination in lakes, streams, and wells. There were questions about water pipes that had been in the ground for decades, in some cases more than a century. There were worries about the rising frequency of hard storms and floods and the damage they did. And the Water Sustainability Commission, as it was called, conducted hearings around the state. And in 2012, it came out with a report that it, that it titled, excuse me, New Hampshire Lives on Water, in which it said that the public and ultimately its representatives in government ought to pay attention to the state's waters to assure that they'd always be safe, plentiful, and clean. The idea was that water was a positive part of identity and economic well-being, but it wouldn't always be that way if citizens and the government didn't, did not stay on top of things. The New Hampshire Lives on Water report had a somewhat technical feel uh, in that it uh, focused much on water supply systems and also the need for infrastructure investments on the order of close to $3 billion. Um, but the report was not written primarily for technocrats, engineers, and hydrology PhDs. It was written largely for ordinary citizens on the assumption that it's ultimately citizens as taxpayers, as rate payers, as voters and as people who live and work in and around water, who will determine what happens to lakes, streams, and ponds in the state. In that sense, the report aimed to raise awareness about water, a reasonable goal. New Hampshire has had a relationship with water for a long, long time. Thousands of years ago, water in its frozen state retreated north and on the way it scooped out where thousands of lakes and ponds and rivers and streams are today. Water's influence showed itself later in the state's western boundary as it was drawn 275 miles out of the, along the Connecticut River as it flowed south to Long Island Sound. So here was water's early influence, the movement of glaciers and the drawing of a boundary. Then came commerce, starting with the highways that rivers produced provided, then came water power, then came the iconic 
bridges that span New Hampshire's waters. Then came uh, tourism and recreation around lakes, waters, ponds, and rivers. That lake should look familiar to you. And soon enough came problems, sewage, pollution, industrial pollution, dumping garbage into waters. It's a continuing and current problem. In 2019, New Hampshire state government sued eight different companies over the presence of the dangerous PFOI class of chemicals in wells and other waters of the state, echoing legal actions that had taken a dozen years earlier against the makers of MTBE, a gasoline additive that had wound up in local wells. The bottom line is that water is a big deal in our state. It's influenced our economy, it's influenced our culture, it's influenced our thinking about the environment, it's influenced the shape and character of our communities, and its future has some people worried. I began to appreciate all of this in 2012 when my tiny town of Roxbury, population 211, celebrated its bicentennial. And for a commemorative booklet about the town, I wrote a short article about why so much of Roxbury remained built, unbuilt, and green. The explanation was thousands of acres of watershed protections around two drinking water reservoirs for the neighboring city of Keene and also land protections around a federal flood control dam that's in town. There'll never be a parking lot on those protected lands, no houses, no apartments, no stores ever. And after the bicentennial, I found myself drawn to a stream that connected the two reservoirs. It's called Roaring Brook. And sitting by that stream, I eventually came to ask myself if water could assure that a community would remain green, I mean, what other ways might water influence society? The question led to a book. The book's about water, but it's mainly about people. The setting is largely in New England from roughly 1800 to today, the beginning of the water powered industrial revolution. My research eventually led to this presentation today in which we'll explore a variety of topics, including immigration legacy, how the mills of the 19th and 20th century helped contribute to the rich mix of the, cultural, of, the culture of the population today, the roots of our industrial heritage, how water power set the stage for a manufacturing future, citizen action, how citizens have worked to protect our waters over the years, values, how our values around water have evolved and sometimes come into conflict, and finally, what a person can do in the cause of inland waters today. Through these topics, we'll see how fresh water has helped define New Hampshire in more than a few ways. And when we're done, I hope to leave you with a deeper understanding of what water has meant to us in the past, what it means to us now, and what can be done to assure that water in New Hampshire will be clean and plentiful in the future. Now, a word here before we start, with this presentation, as it goes on, I, I give you permission to drift off occasionally to reflect on a stream or a pond or a, a river that you pass every day but don't think much about. Later, you might ask yourself, where in that stream did the water come from? And also where that water might be headed. And you might consider also what's in the water that wasn't in it 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And you might wonder how that water might there might have changed over the years and how it might change in the future. So let's start with immigration. The mills of the 19th and 20th century employed mill workers, lots of them. The first supply came from New Hampshire itself. In many cases, young women looking to avoid the drudgery of their mother's lives by taking up mill work in cities and towns. But the sheer size of those operations, for example, the Amoskeag Mills in Manchester that in a single building employed more than 17,000 workers required more hands than New Hampshire could provide. Excuse me. Excuse me for uh, missing my notes here. Hence, 
migrants to build the mills, work in the mills, and help keep the machinery of the mills running. And those migrants brought their culture with them to the point in the case of Pembroke, a mill town that employed hundreds upon hundreds of Canadians from Quebec. The language on the street was French. English was the second language. The Census Bureau reports today that nearly 20% of New Hampshire's population traces its ancestry to Ireland. Another 18% claim English heritage. Another 15% trace their lines to France. And more than 10% have French Canadian roots. Now, not all these people are descended from mill workers. For one, more than half of the current population in the state moved here after the last mills closed. And second, many migrants in the 19th and 20th century came for other industries, the railroads, the mines, the shoe factories, the mountain resorts. But we know that mills played a role in their cultural connections because mill owners around the state routinely recruited prospective workers in Canada and the British Isles. And signs of that resulting communica cultural communications connections are in plain sight. The Highland Games, one of the largest celebrations of Scottish art and culture in North America take place in New Hampshire. And all those dance traditions we know about, contra dancing and square dancing and Morris dancing, they got here somehow. There are still other expressions of migrant influence. For example, there's the Franco-American Center in Manchester that makes a big deal of the annual Saint Jean Baptiste Day in June. The center also runs a poutine fest. It's a celebration of the Quebec delicacy of fries, gravy, and curds. There's St. Anthony Parish in Manchester that today conducts one of its Sunday masses in French still. At its first mass in 1899, two thirds of the parishioners were Francophones, surely in some part due to local mill operators who had sent recruiting teams north to Quebec. So just how much do our cultural connections today owe to the mills? That's for cultural anthropologists to measure, but I expect that to give a fair, enough to give a fair nod to the water without whose movement those mills would not have been built in the first place. Now there's another no legacy from those mills. Today, New Hampshire, which to many people is a nature's calendar, nature, pa nature calendar's paradise of mountains, lakes, and streams, is one of the most industrialized states in the nation. Nearly 11% of the workforce is employed in manufacturing, greater than any other state in the Northeast. The distinction started early. In 1820, there were 2,500 water wheels churning in New Hampshire. The equivalent of one for every 98 citizens, the largest, densest concentration of water power in the young nation. Most of the early mills were small, but soon enough, big ones were built in what became cities. And let me pick up here with an elegant passage about the transformative impact of all that from James Garvin, the state architectural historian. The bells of our mills taught an agricultural people to work by the clock rather than by the sun. By 1870, New Hampshire employed 46,500 people manufacturing virtually the same number working in agriculture. He adds, mastery of the many skills needed to process textiles, paper, leather, and woodwork also earned New Hampshire a high reputation in engineering and invention, in the production of foundry products, machinery and machine tools, and in power generation and transmission. The capital generated by our mills helped to make all of New England a financial center of power and influence. The legacy of that is in the industrialized economy of the Granite State today. And one more legacy of water power is in the urban landscapes of more than a few communities in the great brick buildings that used to house mills by the sides of streams. Recently, the New York Times published an article about fresh interest being paid to these old buildings to give them a second act. And message there, our water power history remains with us in plain view in our townscapes and cityscapes. Now I said at the outset, I talk about four things, how the mills won, how the mills in New Hampshire, mills altered New Hampshire's cultural mix, how water power set the roots of our industrial heritage, how citizens have made a difference around water, and finally, how our values around water have evolved and sometimes come into conflict. 
we've arrived now at citizen action. One of the most inspiring parts of my findings of my research into water was the extent to which citizens have had hand in the protection of rivers, lakes, and watershed lands. Protection, protection from who and what? Why, from us, of course. It was humans who caused most of the contamination that we're dealing with over the years. It was humans who've thrown trash into rivers. It was humans who introduced invasive species of fish and vegetation to local waters. It was humans who caused shores to erode by what they've done or not done on the lands near rivers and ponds. But humans in New Hampshire and elsewhere have also made positive changes in and around waters over the years. They've shown that they can correct their ways. It's worth showing how. Because knowing what we've done in the past can help build confidence that we can take on new challenges today and tomorrow. I'm going to describe cases where citizens acting individually in groups and in some cases through government achieve good things in local waters. These examples, each distinctive in its own way, will take us to the shores of Lake Sunapee, then to a culvert that carries a stream beneath the road near Keene, then to an urban runoff control project in Dover, and finally to the lands and waters of the White Mountains. And I tell these stories to show how change can be made to happen. And after telling these stories, I'll take up the complex character of conflicts that can occur around inland waters, confirming that the story about water in New Hampshire is as much about sociology as it is hydrology. Ultimately, it's a story about us. Story number one, the citizens around Lake Sunapee. In 1847, trains began delivering city folk to the shores of this wonderful 4,000 acre lake. Camping parties showed up, spiritualists arrived and armies of boaters and anglers took to the water. Resort hotels and casinos got built, steamboats plied the, the carrying hundreds of passengers plied the lake and the summer calendar was filled with water festivals, regattas, and carnivals. And meanwhile, water-powered mills on the Sugar River at the outlet of the lake fueled a booming local economy. But not everybody was happy around the lake's waters, and that included a lawyer from Worcester, Massachusetts, who had taken to summering on the Sunapee shores. In the closing years of the 19th century, William Swinton Bennett Hopkins had become alarmed at what was happening into the lakes thanks to the operations of the mills. He helped organize a lake association and he drafted a legal challenge to the mill owners practices of raising and lowering the water level as suited their production schedules and storing logs in public waters and fouling those waters with sawdust. In August, 1898, he held forth at a gathering in his cottage and he later set down his thoughts that inquiry, quote, the purity of these waters is of paramount importance. The lake is the one jewel that calls in all here. The man who builds his house on a hill and does not reach the shore at all, were it not for the lake, would not have built it there. Carelessness, even the to slightest toleration of the introduction of impurity will destroy the healthfulness of the region repel the newcomer who should be invited and destroy the value of what we have already established. That was the opening salvo of the Lake Sunapee Protective Association, the first citizen run environmental group in the state. Now, Colonel Hopkins, who was a Civil War veteran, did not live to see what came of that organization, but he would have been impressed if he had. I'm impressed. What happened is next is this stirring example of what can happen when citizens put their energies together and also how they can change with the times. In fact, how they can make change happen. In 1904, the Lake Association lobbied the New Hampshire legislature for limits on the fluctuations of lake levels caused by dam operators. As time went on, the group took on other issues, including pollution from steamboats, the silting effects of logging on nearby hills and the need for sanitary standards for dwellings on the lake's 32 miles of shore. In the 1950s, the association, which was still pretty much a property owners group, began turning to science, first with testing the quality of lake water, 
and later asking towns in the watershed to hire health officers. In the 1970s, it hired its first paid staff and ordered up more water quality studies. The Deepwater Lake was generally clean, but with more homes going up, more roads being salted in winter and more motorboats leaking fuel, the risks of pollution were rising. In the 1980s, the Lake Association began pushing for local land use controls near the water's edge. In the 1990s, it began testing streams that flowed into the lake and it started taking its messages about water quality into local schools. In time, it began teaching swimmers to look out for invasive weeds that might arrive on trailer boats. And sure enough, in 2001, it learned that Eurasian water milfoil, an aggressive weed, had gotten into the lake. Working with state officials, the association installed fiberglass barriers to, drop the, to trap the weed, and it trained volunteers to snatch out any of the resilient vegetation that got through. The result being one of the few cases in New Hampshire, in fact, in New England, where water milfoil has been eradicated. In 2005, an ecologist from New York on sabbatical at Sunapee heard about a plan just then forming to link up research from lakes around the world. The plan, one massive network of sensing devices and scientists working on such subjects as algae and invasive species and the effects of climate change on lakes. The ecologists saw a, a prototype of a buoy that could collect all sorts of data about water in a lake. And later she and her colleagues at the Lake Association worked with the local college to design and install a sensing buoy. It became part of what's now a network of 120 similar buoys on six continents, all sending information into a shared body of knowledge about the different things that can happen to deep lakes, shallow lakes, big lakes, small lakes, none affected precisely like the others. The Lake Association science didn't end there. It's now prominently involved in a government funded study to find out why the Northeast has lately been seeing increases in toxic algae, a condition that's normally found only in farming regions. Question then, would Sunapee today be an international center and focus of lake science had citizens not gotten together on its shores so long ago and stayed active on those shores? Answer, not likely. In the 1830s, Alexis de Tocqueville, the French historian, picked up on this tendency to citizen commitment to our young country. Paraphrasing him a bit, he said, at the beginning of any new undertaking in France, you'll see government in control. In England, you'll see a great Lord in charge. In America, however, you'll find citizens and citizen groups getting things done. That observation has been put to a real test in recent decades a period when studies have shown that Americans are receding from public school, not running for local office, not signing up for the PTA. But apparently water is different, especially in the last 50 years or so, thanks to new thinking about the environment. Here we have countless Americans voluntarily getting together to conserve watershed lands, pulling invasive weeds out of ponds, planting watershed, waterside vegetation to prevent erosion and more. It's believed that across the country, there are as many as 6,000 member supported river councils, lake associations and watershed groups looking out for water. And as you can see in and around Tamworth itself, these associations aren't passive. In them, you see action, you see collaboration, you see the community spirit that the Tocqueville saw nearly 200 years ago. I have a fresh example of that, that spirit of commitment. It has to do with a culvert. Culverts are pipes that carry water beneath one side of the road to the other. There are countless millions of these things in the country, irrelevant to most people in part because, well, they're mostly out of sight, hence out of mind. In my, my tiny town of Roxbury, which has 11 miles of public roads, only half of them paved, there are fully 75 pipes that carry water from one side of the road to the other. These pipes and Rox in Roxbury and elsewhere are increasingly important in part due to the inability of some of them to handle the intense downpours that are becoming more frequent. Then there's this idea, increasingly understood by environmentalists, 
that culverts of the wrong size or placement can interrupt the flow of water to the detriment of the natural order of things, including the movement of aquatic wildlife. In 2003, a science teacher in Southwestern New Hampshire formed an organization to help ordinary citizens make a difference in the Ashwelet River watershed. He called it the Ashwelet Valley Environmental Observatory. It was in the modern category of citizen science organizations in which ordinary people go into the field to survey invasive plant species, document vernal pools, help keep track of the movement of animals, birds, and so on. In 2006, that nonprofit organization, which is based at Keene State College, trained more than 80 volunteers to survey the condition of nearly 1,000 culverts and bridges in the Ashwelet River watershed. And there, from their reports, a couple of nonprofits, including the Nature Conservancy and Trout Unlimited, picked a couple of culverts to do something about. The first was a pipe that carried the waters of Falls Brook, a small tributary of the Ashwelet in Swansea, south of Keene, beneath the two-lane Hale Hill Road. Among other things, the six foot wide culvert beneath the road interrupted the continuity of the brook and prevented the passage of fish. In 2016, that six foot wide pipe was replaced by a 23 foot wide structure that looks like a bridge. The water in Falls Brook today flows freely from one side of the road to the other. The 10 miles of habitat upstream are now seamlessly connected to the 10 miles of habitat downstream. The project cost close to three quarter, a quarter of a million dollars, funded largely by the state and federal government with support from environmental groups. And that raises a legitimate question as to how many such projects are financially feasible. But as for the citizen volunteer part of the equation, signs are that there's not much to worry about. In the case of the Falls Brook project, volunteers were enlisted to plant native edible plants by the side of the brook. The plants had been raised by a teacher and her students at Keene State College. Later, students from the local Waldorf school helped remove invasive plants from around the culvert and they helped count up trout in the stream. And later college interns returned to water the new plantings. An organizer of the project later told me it truly was a community effort. Starting with these 80 volunteers who years earlier took the time to go checking on the seemingly lowest, lowliest of things, pipes that carried water from one side of a road to the other. On to another topic, controlling urban runoff in Dover. Two decades ago, citizens Dover got their hands on water testing equipment and sampled the polluted waters of the Cochico River in a small tributary called Berry Brook. They sent the results to the state, which shared them with the EPA, and after which the state and federal governments declared that, among other things, the waters of Berry Brook were unfit for human contact. The source of contamination wasn't any of the usual suspects, a factory, an ancient dump, a leaking sewage plant, but instead the totality of the built environment in the area. The bacteria in the stream had been delivered by runoff of rain and snowmelt as it passed over the leavings of modern human settlement, consisting of dog dew, oil, grease, road salt, lawn fertilizer, residue from construction projects, road paving, and so on. How to make a dent in that? In an alignment of the stars that included an interested city hall, a stormwater research center at the nearby University of New Hampshire, a public works director who was open to change, and government agencies with money to spend, a plan was hatched to reduce the flow of runoff into the brook by capturing rain where it fell. That meant coming up with a series of ways to collect rain coming off of roofs and storing runoff in rain gardens and the like. It meant cutting back on the share of hard impermeable surfaces in Dover that had prevented rain from soaking into the ground. It meant coming up with regulations that required that new sidewalks be porous. It meant discarding the old way of doing things, which had been to capture rainwater in gutters and pipes and funnel it off to the brook. It meant removing a pipe that for a century had kept 
1,100 feet of Berry Brook underground so that now it can be exposed to the open air and the cleansing functions of vegetation and aquatic microorganisms. It meant in the end a vast reduction in the volume of contaminants getting into the stream. Now recently, it came time, when it came time to celebrate the rescue of Berry Brook, the member supported river association that took those first water samples two decades earlier was nowhere in the crowd. It had disbanded, its leading figure having moved out of state and its members having gone their own ways. But the fact is that it was that river association that had rescue had started, leading one to wonder, one to wonder whether, were it not for that citizens group, the rescue and the runoff reforms in the whole city of Dover would have happened at all. Moving on to the White Mountains. The painting here is by Benjamin Champney, a native of New Ipswich, who was a big figure in the 19th century White Mountain School of Landscape Painters. But first a word about a contemporary of his, the early environmentalist George Perkins Marsh of Woodstock, Vermont. In his book, Man and Nature, published in 1864, Marsh decried the, quote, collateral and unsought consequences of human action, unquote. He was referring to loggers who clear cut forests by, on hills by the sides of streams, which led to erosion and damaging floods downstream. Here's what those loggers left behind. Awful, but there's a happy ending here. The story involves a bit of judicial history. The story begins with Robert Fulton, the father of steamboat travel in the early years of the 19th century. Robert Fulton owed his early business success to his technology, yes, but mainly to a monopoly on Hudson River transport that had been granted to him by the state of New York. Competitors sued. Of historical note, their lawyer was Daniel Webster, the distinguished New Hampshire native from Franklin. In 1824, the US Supreme Court ruled that the monopoly that had been granted by New York was wrong. The court ruled that in the cause of interstate commerce, the federal government has the final say and ultimate responsibility for what happens on public waters, including rivers and streams. Fast forward 90 years to a situation in New Hampshire in which citizens had become alarmed at what loggers were doing in the White Mountains. Loggers in the mountains were stripping hillsides bare, leading to fires that filled the air with smoke, generally despoiling the environment and causing erosion and floods in rivers that swept away downstream bridges and forced mills to close. An alliance of downstream mill operators, mountain resort managers and nature lovers launched efforts to buy lands away or back from the lumber. They wanted their nature back. They wanted this back, as pictured by the landscape luminary Thomas Cole. But New Hampshire was a small state with too little financial money to make much of a difference. The citizens then looked to Washington, D.C. to protect the land by buying it. And there they met people from the Appalachian regions who had similar concerns about what was happening to nature there. The reception in Congress was frosty. Quote, not one cent for scenery barked Joseph Cannon of Illinois, the Speaker of the House. By today's standards, that's a remarkable, astonishing thing to say. But Washington at the time had no experience buying land for preservation. The nation's magnificent parks and preserves, Yosemite, Yellowstone, the Grand Canyon, and so on, they had not been bought from private owners with taxpayer dollars. They had been carved out of vast lands that the government had already claimed. All the lands in northern New Hampshire that were being deforested and ruined were owned by private parties, not government groups. But now entered John Wingate Weeks, a native of Lancaster, turned banker who had come to represent Man uh, Massachusetts in Congress. He came up with an idea. The idea was that the logging practices on hillsides weren't just damaging the land, they were also damaging the streams and rivers that flowed through those lands by sending silt and other damaging runoff into the waters. And he recalled, didn't that Supreme Court ruling in 1824 say that the government had a responsibility to look out for rivers and streams? Then what better way to protect those rivers and streams than by buying up the lands that surround them? Environmentalists on this call 
will know where this is leading. It was the Weeks Act, enacted in Congress and signed by law by, into law by President Taft in 1911 that authorized the federal government to buy up lands to protect public waterways, an act that ultimately led to the creation of the 800,000 acre White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire in May. The Weeks Act ultimately resulted in the preservation of 25 million acres of open space, a startling accomplishment that began with citizen action. Now, these stories so far have been about citizens working together in unified, energetic, and productive ways. But we've been wrong to assume that all citizens are always unified. Citizens are people too, and they're not always of one mind when it comes to when they're around water. In the 1850s, the people who owned and ran mills low on the Merrimack River in Massachusetts built dams upriver to provide storage for when water was needed by those mills. Here's one of those dams. Not everybody liked those dams. Local farmers saw their lands getting flooded by the impoundments behind them. Local mill operators lost the ability to control water for their own uses. Ferry boat operators upstream of the dams complained that they couldn't safely navigate waterways when water levels fluctuated according to the production schedules of Massachusetts mill owners. The tensions led to lawsuits, legislation that went nowhere, then riots, and in September 1859, an attack on a dam in a tributary of the, Menenna, of the Merrimack in what's now part of Laconia. A trial of the vigilante vandals ended with a hung jury. But the ultimate winners were the dam investors who continued to control those New Hampshire waterways for more than half a century until steam power pushed hydropower aside. River impoundments in the area today aren't, don't flood farmland and water levels don't rise and fall on the whims of mill operators. But it would be wrong to think that differences over dams were just a 19th century thing. There are differences about them today. Not everybody's on the same page about what should happen to them. Their values can come into conflict. There's an old mill dam on the Ashwila River in Keene that's been getting some fresh attention. The debate is about whether the dam should be kept up as a salute to the city's industrial heritage or be redesigned or taken down in deference to an earlier claimant to that river, fish. The stone dam is visually impressive, 160 feet across and 16 feet high. It's in a public park near a bridge, part of the landscape of a city that beginning in the 19th century thrived largely thanks to mills. But the dam has become a safety concern and the state has said that it ought to be fixed up or taken down. Recently, a public gathering was arranged to gather views about what should happen to the dam. As president of the Historical Society of Cheshire County at the time, I have an interest. I'm an advocate of cultural awareness, of respect for history, of knowing where we came from. And so when I was asked at the beginning of the gathering, what should happen to the dam? I said firmly that it ought to be repaired and kept up for all to see. And then after an hour's discussion of design and engineering options that pictured various fish ladder installations and revisions, I was asked again, what ought to happen to the dam? I surprised myself. I said that the thing ought to be taken down leave the bulwarks on the sides to remind Keene of its industrial past, I said, and also leave it to the Historical Society and its friends to do the job of reminding the public of Keene's industrial past. In my view, the fish ladders would Im immense cement structures would deface the old mill dam. They would deface, def de deface history itself. For all the good they do, here's what fish ladders can look like. I thought, Better to give fish the whole width and length of the river. After all, they were using the river long before the mill showed up. And meanwhile, spare the taxpayers of Keene the continuing costs of maintaining the dam. Keene hasn't yet decided what to do about the West Street Dam. A decision has been deferred to 2024, but rest assured, whatever the city does, it'll have both supporters and critics and as someone who has taken both sides of this debate, I'll be interested in how this drama concludes. 
Now around water, we differ over other things too. For example, over the years, there've been legal battles, battles over whether people who live around a lake can block outsiders from getting into those waters via boat ramps. And two, we have differences over what the public is allowed to do on public watershed lands that are around drinking water reservoirs. Here's a sign on the watershed lands that surround Keene's two drinking water reservoirs in the town of Roxbury, where I live. Look at what's not allowed on these taxpayer owned lands, public lands. No hiking, boating, bathing, swimming, including dogs, no trapping, fishing, hunting, camping, on and on. The penalty for violating the rules up to one year in jail and a fine of $100,000. You think that's tough to swallow? Five years ago, the managers of Manchester's reservoir, whose job is to assure clean water, set a rule that horseback riders have to keep to particular trails on the surrounding watershed. And if not that, then put diapers on their horses. You can imagine how that went down. One trail rider who mounted a protest told me, the whole issue was ridiculous. I've been shoveling horse manure for 43 years. Trust me, if we were hazardous to human health, I would have been dead long ago. And finally, a conflict over water that's in the ground. In the 19th century, people flocked to natural springs in New Hampshire for the water's healing properties. Here's a promotion for a spring water company in Londonderry that lasted into the second decade of the 20th century for its claims of being able to cure romantic fever. Not just romantic fever, but acid stomach, indigestion, heart disease, kidney disease, insomnia, insanity, apoplexy. It's quite some water. Milford too had made a name for supplying the acme of table waters from springs at the time when public water in particularly in congested cities was distinctly unsafe. Here's a promotional pitch for Ponemal water, a product of those Milford springs. We do not claim, as it is claimed by many mineral waters, that Ponemal water will cure Bright's disease, that's a kidney disease, and other incurable ailments, but we do claim that in the cure of all diseases caused by affected kidneys or disordered stomach, it is an invaluable aid and an indispensable adjunct <clears throat> to medical treatment, and as such is highly recommended by eminent physicians. Ponemal water is no longer sold, but the business of bottling water coming out of the ground continues in parts of New Hampshire. A century after chlorine, the universal disinfectant, began relieving the public's weariness about the safety of public water. But not everyone is happy about the modern bottling of local waters. In 2006, the residents of Barnstead passed a local law that bans corporations from mining and selling town water. And I've heard from residents in Peterborough complain about convoys of trailer trucks that are hauling water from a local private property to a bottler in Connecticut. The critics see a natural resource being taken for commercial uses out of state. New Hampshire law is on the side of the tanker trucks because the water withdrawals in Peterborough began before the state laid down rules that limit them. The Peterborough operation was grandfathered in. And then too, there are people who are troubled by where the water winds up in disposable plastic bottles. So handy and yet so wasteful. And also another example of the breadth of our connection to water. Now at the outset of this talk, I mentioned a report that was titled, New Hampshire Lives on Water. And in that light, I'd suggest some specific actions with regard to water that we might consider. First, we can salute the constructive steps that have already been taken in the cause of clean water. This is a stormwater grate on the campus of Keene State College. The drawing of the fish means that the rain and snow melt that goes down that grate winds up going directly into the Ashwaubenon River. In most cities in older settled parts of the Northeast, stormwaters aren't sent directly to rivers, but instead are piped to sewage plants. That means that when rains fall particularly hard, as has been happening, those sewage plants can't control or handle all the volume of stormwater and sewage coming at them, and so they overflow meaning raw sewage going straight into rivers. That doesn't happen in Keene because storm waters go straight into the river. And in fact, due to far-sighted thinking for which Keene is widely known, the flow of rainwater that goes in those streams, in those drains, 
is being lessened by the construction of rain gardens in Keene. By that I mean holes in the ground that are filled with loam and gravel and vegetation to soak up rainwater near where it falls instead of piping it off to the river. That's something we can be thankful for, an enlightened city government that did the right thing. We should salute such progress when we see it. What else can we do as citizens? We can insist that our little officials ask why there have been so many destructive rainstorms in recent years and do something about that. We can demand that government regulate chemicals behind those wondrous new consumer products before those chemicals wind up in our waters. And we should take the steps with understanding that while some environmental damage can be corrected quickly, some of the corrections can take even decades, even longer to have effect. In recent years, the people living around Squam Lake, the setting for the classic film, On Golden Pond, in which loons play an important role, have been noticing a decline in the hatching of baby loons. They went looking and they found that part of the problem might be that adult loons were eating fish that had, had DDT in their systems. How's that? In the 1940s, scientists came up with DDT, the first synthetic insecticide. It was to protect us from malaria and other insect-borne diseases and to protect farm crops from, from insect infestation, a worthy ambition. But in time, the chemical was found to have negative health and environmental effects, so the government banned it. It's been half a century since DDT was taken off the market, yet it's apparently still around in the environment. Likewise, another long banned class of chemical, PCB, that's also been found in loon eggs. Yesterday, just this week, the state of New Hampshire sued Monsanto, the maker of PCBs, for the lasting con con contamination that it has caused. What's the lesson here? The lesson is that some contaminations run deep and long. Therefore, take more care before putting chemical uses solutions to use. What else can we do? Well, we can prepare ourselves to pay more for public water to help cover the costs of upgrades to our ancient water distribution systems. We can support spending more money to conserve watershed lands as has been happening around Tamworth, because it costs less to keep pollutants from getting into the water than it costs to wring those pollutants out. We can do what other folks have done and support a local lake association or river council. We can insist on the regulation of chemicals. We can take an interest in where our water comes from and where it might be headed. We can, in short, put more attention and resources into our water we can act on our responsibility to water, to our environment, and ultimately to ourselves. And all the while, as we work on behalf of water and ourselves, we should stop from time to time and take in the sublime beauty of water, as did Rockwell Kent in this painting of Dublin Lake in 1903. Water isn't just something that we drink or put to use or attempt to control. Water is an expression of nature, wondrous, powerful, calming, unpredictable, deep. So in conclusion, New Hampshire does live on water in more ways than one. Thank you. I'd be happy to take some questions. I can also bring up something I discovered uh, this week as I was preparing to uh, make a presentation to folks in Tamworth. And that is, I came upon a uh, work that the Lake Association and the Tin Mountain Conservation Group have been doing together, uh, particularly involving uh, Allen Brook, but some other waterways. And that's involved uh, putting wood pieces of wood, sometimes large pieces of wood, into Allen Brook and other streams. When that happens, and the, and the reason they do that is that, that decaying wood provides uh, nutrient and other benefits to aquatic wildlife. But when you put that wood in there, it makes a stream look like an awful mess. And we're used to streams looking beautiful. When you look at a nature calendar, it's always a beautiful babbling brook, not with 
just a mess of old fallen logs and trees in it. So one of the things we can also do is learn to understand what a stream looks like in nature's design. That is, it's not neat and pretty the way we might, and manicured the way we might like it. It's got all the messiness of nature in it. And we should begin to appreciate that. So I will stop talking here and look forward to hearing your questions or your experiences around water because I'm here to learn too. Thank you. I like to build bridges across water. Is there anybody who needs a bridge? <laughs> I have you a quick quest question. Um, thank you very much. This was a great uh, presentation. Thank but you. just in your research uh, about his water in New Hampshire, what do you have to say about indigenous people and waterways as far as we can tell? <laughs> well, first involving uh, indigenous people, we ought to recognize uh, <clears throat> their contribution to their, their contributions, not only to the names of the, of the bodies of water that surround us, but uh, yeah. to their having the first claim on these lands. As for their use of the water, um, uh, my stories uh, also include uh, the disruption of uh, indigenous people's lives by the construction of power dams. Um, and in the book, I make mention of a tragic case in Maine in the uh, 18th century in which uh, dam builders, uh, all working in the cause of power uh, wound up uh, substantially altering the lives of indigenous people. But as for indigenous people's use of the rivers, well, they were used as uh, water, as a uh, uh, as roadways. Uh -huh. uh, it's how people got from one place to another. Uh, I'm not aware of any permanent damage done to waterways by Native Americans. Um, uh, I think it was in their interest to keep waters clean and sustained. So I'm afraid I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but. Um, I was just curious about your perspective. I mean, and you showed the Amaskeg Mills, which that was a big gathering place from what I've understood for salmon fishing and, um, you know, and, and also just meeting. And then the other place in our area that we're aware of is the Weirs in, Lacon in uh, Laconia was actually, uh, you know, a, a very old uh, spot for, for catching fish. Well, in fact, yes, indeed. Um, there's a couple of cases I cite in the book that I came upon in my research where um, uh, uh, the movement of salmon was ended, uh, mm -hmm. not just salmon, but shad and other, uh, uh, other fish. Uh, it was ended by uh, Western development, if I can use that term. And uh, that's one of the tragedies because uh, the salmon are, in some cases are coming back, but uh, they're, they're not coming back in most instances. Mm. But the tragedy is back then is that whole livelihoods were taken away. All food sources were taken away by the industrial advance of European settlers. Mm. Not a happy story. Right. One of the uh, earliest uh, sightings of a fish uh, catching or harvesting devices uh, is not far from where I'm seated, where uh, Native Americans had created, a, they structured stones in a river in such a way that they could direct the movement of, of fish to more e easily harvest them. And um, that was completely disrupted by the construction of uh, power dams. And uh, 
Initially, the Native Americans uh, objected, but didn't have much power. Uh, subsequently, uh, settlers upstream of the power dam also came to uh, object uh, because now their supply of fish was being imperiled. And so they got some legislation passed that assured that some fish could get by. But I don't, I don't mean to, there are plenty of reasons to be have, be, have a, be a downer when it comes to our behavior around water. But as has been, uh, I tried to show in today's talk, uh, there, have been, there have been a good many instances of citizens working together with government too, to reverse some of those, some of that damage, or at least to prevent it from getting worse. So call me an optimist in some regards. Thank you. Um, I'm, this is Mary. I thank you, Jim, for mentioning at the beginning the Shikora Lake Conservancy and Green Mountain Conservation Group. I think they are both doing important work. Um, they both, um, and the lake associations, every lake around here has an association. I live in Madison and we have the Silver Lake Association and they've, um, they've managed to keep milfoil out of Silver Lake so far from their lake monitoring program. There is no milfoil in Silver Lake. Well, that is a credit to that lake association and yeah. it requires work. It doesn't, it didn't just, it's not just by chance that it's milfoil free. No. It, it's true. No, no, the volunteers and um, they, they budget annually to hire um, high school students to monitor the boats that are coming in and they have a boat washing station, all that. Um, I noticed that um, Green Mountain Conservation Group had on their website a list of the towns that they have um, that have drinking water protection ordinances because their main um, spot of concern is the Ossipi Lake Aquifer, which is I think one of the biggest in New Hampshire, and we're all sitting right on it here in um, Tamworth and Madison, this area, Effingham, Ossipi. But they are, um, it seems that every town except Tamworth has adopted a drinking water ordinance um, that it didn't pass in Tamworth, but it did in the other towns in the, in the aquifer. So it seems that uh, they did some good lobbying work, um, but maybe could do some more. I know someone was saying recently, we have two volunteers at the library and they were working on a, um, a survey of the stream crossings. Um, the bridges and the stream crossings in the Ossipee Lake um, area. So it sounds a lot like the, I can't say the name of the river over by Keene, Ashwil, Ashwil. That's right. Okay. You pronounced it fine. Similar project. It sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it involves a lot of people and that's what uh, stirred my interest in it. But I like, uh, I take interest in common things. Uh, um, culverts being one of those common things. Something we don't even see, but there are far more, far many more culverts than there are bridges. And um, they need to be um, kept current. Uh, you know, the intensity of rainstorms is uh, uh, indisputed. And um, we've seen some flooding around in my town and other areas around here, hence, uh, significant resources are going into replacing those culverts and replacing them with larger culverts. It used to be that uh, FEMA, when it, uh, uh, when it uh, came in and provided funds or services uh, following significant floods, would insist that the, um, if a culvert got washed away, then uh, you had to put in the same size culvert um, as, as a replacement. And it was only in the last, it was only after a, her, a tropical storm Irene, uh, which did a significant number on Vermont, that FEMA began changing its ways and allowing that, yeah, you know, in some cases, uh, if a culvert has to be replaced, um, let's replace it with something bigger than what was there before. That's a, that's a significant advance. <laughs> Thank you, it sure is. Um, I just, you know, I'm reminded of uh, how the Merrimack and the Androscoggin 
have changed over the years to, for the better. Um, uh, and uh, it's interesting how after the Weeks Act, you know, the Merrimack was able to flow better, but then pollution over the years made it a, a joke. <laughs> but, you know, um, but the Merrimack's been cleaned up and the Androscoggin's been cleaned up and other rivers, but I hear recent, very recently, Trump, the administration uh, loosened up some river regulations. I don't know what. Uh, well, the one of the, it's, let me count the ways, but the one significant one uh, was um, the uh, reversal of a of an executive order by um, President Obama that was called the, the, the law or the executive order was the waters, I think it's the Waters of America Act. Anyway, what it, what it did was it extended to small streams, to tributary streams, tributary streams, the same testing requirements for, that you have for large bodies of water like rivers. The position of the um, opponents of that particular change where you, of, the, of that executive order by President Obama said, golly gosh, uh, it, it, that's just a little tiny stream up there. Why do we have to spend any time or money testing the quality or watching out for what gets into it? We should be interested only in the big streams and bodies of water. And the answer to that is, uh, you know, the elbow, the knee bone is connecting to the thigh bone. If there's something happening in the small stream, then if it gets in the big, then, then it's gonna eventually gonna get into the big stream. So we must, look out for and insist on quality, water quality in the smaller streams. That is one particular uh, uh, executive order ruling or policy that was reversed by the Trump administration. So if things change eventually, as uh, let's just say when things change, that the Waters of the America Act or Waters of the American Rule will be returned to our body of law. Well, but good. I'm not. I can't see all of you there, but I have gray hair, and and it's possible that some of you have gray hair. I mean, we 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 grew up in times when, in our lifetime, we dumped raw sewage in, in into rivers, into streams. We, it, it's incredible to for a young person to imagine. We just did it, and um, the fact that we changed our ways again is a sign that. We're capable of change. Uh, we just have to keep at it. I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are about bottled water and how that might affect waterways and water supplies in New Hampshire. Well, there. This is a this is a large field uh, field of discussion. Um, I am not aware of in any case where water supply in a particular, public water supply in a particular community has been diminished so much that it's affected uh, households. Um, um, but I am of a mind that uh, pumping water out of the ground to bottle it and then ship it someplace else in, in a, in a non-disposable bottle or whatever, even if it's disposable, seems awfully wasteful to me. Um, so I'm not a big fan of pumping water out of the ground to, to bottle and have people drink it. But, um, and so I think there ought to be regulations about that. And there are in New Hampshire, just that it, it came late so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. It, it strikes me that bottling water it seems like a pretty unusual industry to, to, for, for us to have in our country. Um, I, I think we're in agreement. Thank you. I think we're in agreement. <laughs> Well, thank you. I, you know, uh, preparing for this talk, I did some, at least uh, 
visitations of your area on the internet. And uh, it's quite a beautiful area. The lake streams there are such a beautiful blue. And uh, it looks like you're as attentive to your environment as they are down here in southwestern New Hampshire. I look forward to traveling up there once uh, our pandemic has passed. Yes, please do, Jim. I, I was just trying to unmute myself to say the same. You're always welcome. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank it's you. a treat to, it's a topic that interests me and uh, I do blog on the subject. If um, <clears throat> I did send uh, my blog uh, address to uh, Amy and- um, uh, We can put it out there for you. Sure. It's a. Uh, it covers the wide range of uh, water issues. Uh, the one that's going to be the next comes out next Tuesday will be about water um, and uh, hydraulic fracking. Um, uh, I've dealt with uh, the waters issues of water on on the planet Mars as well as water much closer to home, and uh, I've highlighted. Uh, really some interesting uh, women who have been in the forefront of looking out for water going way back into the 19th century, among other topics. So I, you might take a look at it. It's fun to write. It's free. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much, Jim. Thanks, so much. thanks everybody thanks for, for coming. Yes. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me and thanks for coming tonight. So long. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>